Hello, Year 12 sir, political scientists. I'm really sorry about the delay. Um, I was trying to record at school and it garbled the recording. And then I came home and uh, the handyman arrived to fix the tap that's been dripping. So um, I do apologize. This is going to go up incredibly late. Um, nevertheless, last lesson we left it, we we're talking about the functions of the House of Lords. And I got Lords stuck in my head because we'll never be royal. Um, and uh, anyway, today's lesson, we're going to be talking, or rather lessons, I suppose, we're going to be talking about the powers of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. We'll then talk about the passage of a bill in Parliament, and then we'll finish up talking about the role of backbenchers and a task that I have for you guys to do based on what I've talked about today, because ultimately, these videos are just voiceover PowerPoints with my face looking at you. Um, and I'm sorry about that because I still haven't had a shave. Anyway, um, yeah, let's, um, I, I would apologize for it, but, but ultimately there's only so much apologizing I can do for my face. Um, so, oh, flip. Um, oh, no, it's not gonna work. Uh, here is the House of Commons powers, the powers of the House of Commons. Uh, it's one of the greatest superpowers you can own, I guess. Uh, the first power of the House of Commons is that they have the sole right to defeat bills. Only the House of Commons can reject legislation. Now, it doesn't mean that anybody can create legislation. It's up to the House of Commons to get rid of it. Rather, only the House of Commons can reject it. The House of Lords can create legislation like the House of Commons, but it cannot definitively reject it. Only the House of Commons can do that. The second thing it's got is that the exclusive right to dismiss a government through a vote of no confidence, a VONC, a V-O-N-C, as I've written it on the side there. Now, this is because of the concept of consent. If you remember, the executive is drawn from a parliament. We don't elect a government. We elect representatives in the form of members of parliament. Parliament has from, drawn from it the executive of the winning party, usually. So that means the government governs through the consent of parliament, not the consent of the people. The people give their consent to parliament, parliament then gives its consent to the executive. If they remove that consent through a vote of no confidence, then you have to go to a general election. The last time this happened was in 1979 and a vote of no confidence in Callaghan's minority Labour administration. They lost it, 310 votes to 311, and Callaghan said, well, we shall take our case to the country and went to a general election, which delivered the Conservatives under Margaret Thatcher. So I guess he lost then. It was attempted, several votes of no confidence were attempted in 2019. You won't find those in the textbook. They hadn't happened yet in May's government, but none of them succeeded. And as a consequence, that's the last successful example. But what it shows is the power of the House of Commons to send a government packing. The next power is they have to agree to the budget. Picks or it didn't happen. If they don't vote in favour of the budget, the budget doesn't go ahead. And only the House of Commons gets to say one way or another whether the budget goes ahead. The image I have there is from 2015. And it was George Osborne's first budget of a majority conservative government in 2015. And those are the tellers basically coming to say that the eyes have it. Uh, they say I rather than yes because they're pillocks. Thank you. Uh, Jay Foreman. Um, and uh, basically the tellers count up the votes and then they come and read them out in front of the speaker and then the speaker announces what the result of the vote is. Um, they legitimise decisions made by government. For example, the sending in of combat troops or the, commission of, uh, the committing of military resources to international issues, such as, say, the bombing of Syria or the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, basically, the executive requires parliamentary consent for every single one of their decisions, because at the end of the day, it is parliament we vote for, not for the executive. Therefore, the ultimate sovereign, the ultimate power in the United Kingdom is our voted representatives in parliament. And parliament tends to refer to the House of Commons. That's their power. Um, Parliament also creates the committees. They select who's on them, the select committee, get it? So here I have an image of an actual select committee in one of the committee rooms of Parliament. That's what they look like. Those, that, that's the wallpaper. That is the maddening wood panelling. And um, those are the seats. I personally 
would find that a difficult environment in which to work. But the, they, they like this. So Parliament is the House of Commons that selects who sits on the influential committees that we talked about previously in the functions of the House of Commons. They also scrutinize legislation. That is their power. It is their power to look at any legislation coming through and decide whether or not it needs amendment, whether or not it needs change, and whether or not it needs to be dealt with somehow. There's also powers of the House of Lords. Um, and we're gonna start with Bajo. His name is Bajo, that's pronounced Bajo, not Bagahot, as I used to think. Bajo wrote a book in 1847 about Parliament, and if you recall, it's one of the sources of our constitution. It's a, a authoritative work. And he argued that the House of Commons was the efficient chamber and the House of Lords merely the dignified chamber. In other words, it was there to look good and to do things in a proper way. But apart from that, didn't do much. And there's some truth to that. However, the House of Lords has no constituents. No one voted them in. They have no one to be responsible to in an election. They can't be voted out. And as a consequence, there's no need to go back to their constituency and hold surgeries to listen to their constituents. There's no need for them to focus on the redress of grievance. There's no need for them to have any contact with the public whatsoever if they don't want it. Um, the uh, Daily Express argued that uh, even Lords admit they're out of touch. Well, yes, that's kind of the point. And as a consequence, what they get to do is spend more time in the House of Lords providing scrutiny for legislation. They get to spend more time debating it. They get to spend more time reading it. They get to spend more time amending it. Arguably, therefore, they're a bit more professional than the House of Commons when it comes to working with the law. And because they're unelected, they're free to act however they wish. An elected representative is caught in constant tension between uh, being a delegate of the views of those who elected them and being a representative in the mould of Edmund Burke, arguing that you don't need to listen to those who elected you. And that tension is quite a difficult one to navigate. After all, you want to be elected again, right? So you've got to do something to represent the people in your constituency and to do as they wish, or they won't vote for you again. Um, whereas the House of Lords don't have to worry about that. They don't have to worry about popular opinion. They simply have to worry about their expertise and how to apply it. The large number of crossbenchers in Parliament, uh, in the House of Lords in particular, means that actually it's really difficult for the government to maintain any kind of power or dominance. Meaning that uh, it's very easy for the House of Lords to do things on their merits rather than based on who's the largest party in the Lords. Uh, because generally speaking, cross benches, cross benches will turn up to most debates, whereas not all Lords are necessarily there at all times. So there's no inbuilt majority, if that makes sense. Uh, they'll do things differently. And it's worth pointing out that most appointments to the House of Lords are non-controversial. Now, obviously, there's uh, allegations of cronyism, and I will be sharing some of those later. Uh, and, and we can absolutely prove there's some of it going on. But at the end of the day, the vast majority of people appointed to the House of Lords as life peers, no one has any truck with. There's, there's not a major issue. Um, there are large numbers of people that do have issues, but not most of them. And as a consequence, most of the House of Lords are experts that everyone agree are experts in their field and are there for that reason. Another way that the House of Lords has powers is that good MPs tend to become good Lords. And um, well, a good MP can be elevated to the House of Lords because they were a good MP. For example, let us take Lord Fowler. Lord Fowler was a former Secretary of State for Health under Thatcher's government. And between 1981 and 1987, one of his crowning achievements was his response to the AIDS HIV crisis, in which he powerfully argued that it shouldn't be seen as a gay disease, and that it should be treated primarily as a health issue. It was him who allowed the slogan, don't die of ignorance, to be a thing, rather than the assumption in the prevailing wind at the time that only homosexuals could get AIDS and HIV. So he kind of broke the mold on that one. And he was a bit of a maverick and allowed to get away with it. When he was elevated to the House of Lords, he 
instantly became a chairman of the Committee on AIDS, HIV in 2010-2011, in which he lambasted government since the 1980s for basically not following through. We had a rise in cases of HIV. Now, it's nothing like other countries in Europe, for example. Our, our health intervention in the 1980s was astonishingly good, and the increase in um, diagnoses of AIDS was largely down to better screening and better testing. But he argued that we weren't as tight on it as, it, as we could be, and we're allowing it to spread in our population again. Now, all right, the numbers are small, but the point is he was listened to. And the point is he changed government policy on that because he was so well respected. In 2014, he wrote a, a, a pamphlet entitled AIDS Don't Die of Prejudice, in which he powerfully argued that people were going back to the idea that only certain people got AIDS and maybe those certain people deserved it. It was part of their choice. And he argued, mm, you can't do that. That's not what it's about. AIDS will spread if we let it. And it's largely down to his watchdog status on this that the British government has maintained a pretty good control of the AIDS HIV crisis. And it is still a crisis, even in the middle of a global pandemic, AIDS is still one of the biggest killers around. In 2016, perhaps unsurprisingly, he got an overwhelming vote in favor of becoming the Lord Speaker of the House of Lords. And the image I have up in there is where the Lord Speaker sits. They sit on a poof, no, really, at the bottom of the steps, because that's how the House of Lords works. Um, don't worry, luckily we don't need to go into that much depth. Um, another good example is a former MP and a former Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, who was elevated to the House of Lords as the Earl of Stockton in 1986 by Margaret Thatcher, the last major famous Prime Minister before Thatcher, uh, and largely still highly respected uh, because of his, you've never had it so good, uh, campaign of 1955, um, seemed like an obvious pick. And yet when he got into the House of Lords, one of the very first things he did as a conservative peer was attack the government's handling of the miners' strike in the 1980s, saying, we don't have time for this sort of thing, about Thatcher's argument that they were the enemy within. In other words, he became a thorn in the side of the government and sparked debate in the Conservative Party about the political direction that it was taking. Why am I using these examples? These examples show very clearly that simply elevating someone to the House of Lords doesn't necessarily guarantee loyalty to the government of the day. And furthermore, it shows the influence that the House of Lords can have over their party and thus over debates that are had in the House of Commons. So whilst they have no direct powers, they do have power in other ways. What other powers do they have? Well, the House of Lords can delay legislation for up to one year, um, according to the Parliament Act of 1949, and of course the Parliament Act of 1911. Um, they can maintain a veto over statutory instruments. Statutory instruments are um, changes to the law, secondary legislation, um, that aren't voted on by the House of Commons. In theory, the House of Lords can look at anything that's been meddled with after a law has been passed, uh, and reject it. They can veto it. And the threat of that was enough to cause George Osborne to change several of his budgets. It hasn't been done, to my knowledge, since 1945 at least, but they maintain that veto. In theory, they could say to any of the Henry VIII powers, um, where they change the law after it's been passed, they could say no, and that would stop it. So it's a theoretical power that they have threatened quite a lot, especially during 2019. And again, you won't find this in the textbook. I'm looking to where the textbook is just over there. Um, again, in 2019, they did that a lot with the EU withdrawal bill and May's government. So it's a theoretical power that gets taken out for a ride every now and again, uh, like joyriding, I guess. Uh, they're a revising chamber. Their main duty, their main power is looking at existing legislation, proposing amendments and changes, and then letting the House of Commons accept those or not. Uh, and that's their job. They, they, they're basically advisory, I suppose. Uh, they can reject any constitutional change, though. Let's say, for example, that a House of Parliament, a House of Commons could have a vote and vote to extend their life beyond five years. It's only five years by convention, but it is considered part of the Constitution. So if the UK uh, House of Commons said, we would like to stay in office for 10 years, let's make it 10 years before the next election, the House of Lords could legally say no and strike it down instantly. And although Parliament is sovereign, the House of Lords is part of Parliament. So they get to tell the House of Commons 
that they can't do that. And that would have to stand. That is part of parliamentary sovereignty. So it doesn't sound like it's very likely, but it is a possibility. So if a general election isn't called by a government, the House of Lords can absolutely force them to do so after five years, which is fascinating. So how does a bill get through Parliament? This bill is Bill Murray. He's playing Peter Venkman in Ghostbusters, but not in this image. He's in a US Army costume, and I don't know what film it came from, but it was the most recognisable picture of Bill Murray I could find. So how do we do it? First and foremost, uh, a bill gets a first reading, and the first reading is when it's introduced to Parliament. Hi, Bill! And people get a chance to read it, discuss it, um, and they talk about whether or not the bill is viable. Will it work? Doesn't matter whether it's a good idea or not. Does it actually read like a bill? Does it read like a law? And that's the first reading. After that, it goes to the second reading. And the second reading is when you get to debate the principles of the bill. Is it a good idea or not? And I've got a picture of someone reading. Um, so people discuss the merits, and the pitfalls of the bill. And after that, they vote on whether or not it gets to the next stage. This is called a division. And there has to be enough MPs in Parliament to make the vote legitimate. If there's only 10 people in Parliament, you can't have a division. There's not enough people. Makes perfect sense, really. So you've got to have what we call quorum. So you've got to have enough MPs to have that vote. Once it's gone through that, it goes to the committee stage. A committee will be assigned to look at it. Uh, they will look at it more in more depth and they will then report on what they find. Now, those reports aren't binding, um, but the idea is that the government of the day can then amend their bill or they can put it up for another vote with amendments made by that being voted by, by that committee, being voted on whether or not they are allowed to be debated by the Speaker uh, and then voted on by the, the entire House of Commons. Once that happens, it goes to the third reading. So we've debated it, we've voted on it, we've decided that it's now a bill that we can vote upon. And the third reading is when people get a chance to say whether or not they like it, then it goes to a vote. If it wins the vote, it goes to transfer. Transfer is when it goes to uh, the House of Lords to get further scrutiny. And the House of Lords does a similar thing. Uh, they have a reading, it goes to the committee stage, there's a report that's not binding, and then it goes to a third reading, and then it's sent back to the House of Commons uh, as is. And the House of Commons can either choose to accept what the House of Lords have done, or they can choose to reject it and pass it anyway, according to the uh, uh, Salisbury Convention, the House of Lords is not meant to make amendments that are deliberately designed to block it. Uh, and according to the Parliament Act of 1949, the House of Commons can simply ignore the House of Lords changes if they wish. Once that happens, it gets royal assent and it becomes the law. I am the law. Uh, that's Sylvester Stallone playing Judge Dredd. And the only line from the film I can remember, oh, no, which always amused me because Sylvester Stallone has a bit of a speech impediment. And in the film, it gets really bad because of the helmet he's forced to wear. And it's difficult to understand that he's saying he is the law. Oh, by the way, the other picture I didn't say, oh, we've got a we've got a conference here. This is a committee. Um, I'm really sad because I had to cut out this side to make it fit. And that had the two colored people in it. Um, and here's a vote. And here's Lord herself um, singing songs. Um, so that's what that the news story said it was about her mysteriously deleting her social media presence and I'll be honest I have literally no idea what it's talking about so um, government bills how do government bills pass all this well um, the first point is duh they're brought by the government it therefore follows that as the government has a majority in parliament the chances are the government are going to get their way um, after all, debate is scheduled by the government. They get to decide how much time is spent on a particular bill and whether or not people get a chance to talk about it. And so it follows that, obviously, there's going to be enough time allocated for the debate of a government bill. It follows that they can rely on the whips to force people to vote for that. And that means when it, different things like voting from a first reading to a second reading or a second reading to the committee or the third reading and the transfer, the government can be generally assured they'll get what they want if they've got a majority, and if that majority is large enough. Um, furthermore, if the bill is in their manifesto, the Lords won't even try and amend it because of the Salisbury Convention. So if you're a government that's been recently elected or has been elected a few years ago, and you're passing a bill that's based on your manifesto, chances are it will pass and it will become law. 
there's very little that can stop it. A strong sense of success, in other words. So that's one sort of bill, but there are others. And these are private members bills. And there are three ways that any MP can make a private members bill happen. Um, the first of these is by ballot. At the beginning of each parliament, there's a ballot on 20 private members bills. And basically you vote on which seven of them go ahead and get debated. Now, the amount of time allocated to these debates doesn't have to be terribly long, and I'll come on to that in a moment. The next way is anyone can introduce a bill to parliament simply by giving a 10 minute speech and then hoping that enough people in parliament want to debate it and that the government will allow it to be debated. Usually this doesn't work. When it is used, people get 10 minutes to give a speech on something, and that's usually the only time that's devoted to it. So it's one method. And finally, there's a formal presentation. You can ask specifically to be included in the parliamentary business and make a presentation on a bill that you would like to be brought into law. Um, this is difficult to organise, it's difficult to secure the time, and chances are you'll be given the graveyard shift when there aren't enough MPs to actually make a division, i.e. a vote, to get it through to the next stage. So there's a limited chance of success. Why? Well, the ballots are usually held on a Friday, for example, so there's limited time. Uh, and on a Friday, a lot of MPs might not even be there. They might have gone home and be doing constitu constituent surgeries on a Friday. Fridays tend to be the day when MPs do business in their constituency rather than at the Houses of Parliament. So it might be there's just not enough people and therefore you can get the first reading and there's not enough people to vote for it to move on to a second reading and that's it, it dies, it's dead. Um, and finally, there's filibustering and that is talking out the time available for a debate. For example, Sam Giana in uh, 2016 talked out the so-called Turing Bill, which would have um, retroactively cancelled the convictions of anyone convicted of homosexuality before 1967 and its legalisation, called the Turing Bill because primarily it was about using the example of uh, Turing, who was convicted of homosexuality, um, and how he should have a pardon. And it would have extended that pardon to literally anybody convicted of homosexual offences uh, before 1967. Now, the Twitter status here you can't click on the screen. Please don't click on the screen. It will pause it multiple times. But the PowerPoint that was available on the Show My Homework this was attached to, and if year 13s are watching this, just ask for the PowerPoint. If you click on that, it'll take you to a Twitter status. I can't find the video anywhere else, and I did look. Uh, but that Twitter status has a, I think, four minute video of Sam Guillermo basically being shouted down, and the speaker having to intervene to stop people shouting him down. But he did. He talked out the debate time, he prevented a vote being taken, and as a consequence, it never went ahead. At that point, Sam Guillermo was a Conservative MP. He later left the party and joined Change UK. Um, and now is a member of the Liberal Democrats. To my knowledge, he no longer has a seat in Parliament, but the textbook didn't know that. It's still an interesting case of a filibuster in the UK Parliament. You may have heard of filibusters in the US Parliament where they get a bit more press, and we will talk about those when we do the US. Mainly though, uh, back private members bills are about raising awareness. Ooh, I left that in Calibri, I'm so sorry. Um, for example, here's Peter Kyle from 2018, um, who introduced a um, representation of the people, young persons enfranchisement bill, um, lowering the age to vote to 16. Um, I could only find a Facebook video on his own Facebook page uh, that showed the debate in process. Uh, I did look on um, YouTube and I looked on Twitter, but this was the only one I could find. So I do apologize. It means you actually have to go to Hove and Portslade videos on Facebook. I am sorry. Um, T's and C's apply, be careful, it's Facebook. But it is a video of him introducing his bill. Uh, I don't think it gets as far as the debate stage. Um, but obviously, neither of these worked. Um, and, uh, oh, rather, this didn't work. It's raised awareness of the issue. Um, were Alex around, he will be able to tell us more about it. There are some successes, however. Uh, the International Development Gender Equality Act of 2014 was brought by, oh, flip, I've not written his name up, I'm an idiot. Uh, this fellow here with the glasses. Um, I'll go and look up his name one more. And that's Bill Cash MP, I've looked him up now. Sorry about that, I, I, I thought I'd remembered it. That's Bill Cash. And what this bill did was it increased the watchdog status of the UK in terms of trade bills and um, made, an in, uh, made the UK government uh, 
include a commitment to gender equality in any new trade bill made with another country. That's pretty big stuff. Uh, it certainly means that it's going to be difficult with places like Saudi Arabia, for example, or Bahrain, uh, that really don't do gender equality. The next one was the Homelessness Reduction Act in 2018, uh, brought by Bob Blackman. Um, and he made it local government's responsibility to try and house local homeless people. And we saw that in action during the pandemic uh, last year during the first lockdown, when local councils were essentially ordered by government to find accommodation for all homeless people so that they were not on the street and therefore a vector for contamination uh, and spreading of coronavirus. Uh, that is now local government's responsibility. And no, they can't ask for extra relief from government. Relief in this case means funding uh, because of this private member's bill. On the face of it, it sounds beautiful to you drill down and realize what that actually means. Um, but there you go. He's very happy about that. Uh, but these are private member's bills that are successful. Now, it's worth pointing out in both of these cases that these are Conservative MPs under a coalition government dominated by the Conservatives and a, co a government that is actually a Conservative government. That might have something to do with their successes. The biggest uh, private members bill, however, the one with the most impact and therefore the biggest example to use in an essay and to know about is the House of Lords Reform Act, which I've mentioned in passing already. It was brought in 2014 by Biles, who was an MP, um, between 2010 and 2015. And this bill said that House of Lords members would be allowed to resign or retire. It also provided a mechanism for the expulsion of lords for non-attendance, i.e. if they didn't turn up to enough debates, they could be chucked out, or if they're engaged in criminal behaviour, whether or not they were in jail. And that was a big deal. Um, so um, what's his name? Geoffrey Archer was elevated to the House of Lords and was convicted of perjury and also of stealing someone else's intellectual property. Uh, the intellectual property in question was a short story entitled The Twist in the Tale, which was about a short story in which the twist was it was about a cat. Um, he judged the uh, competition, which it appeared in, gave it the winning entry, and then promptly wrote a book called <clears throat> A Twist in the Tale, in which the very first short story was almost carbon copied from that winning entry and he made an incredible amount of money from it. He then went to court, lied about it, and not only did he face criminal proceedings for um, nicking someone else's stuff, because he lied in court, he was convicted of perjury, and for that went to jail. But at the time, there was no way of stopping him being a lord. So he was still able to sit in the House of Lords when he left jail. That was it. That th There was no way of getting rid of him until the House of Lords Reform Act of 2014. This improves the effectiveness of the chamber, the House of Lords, because it forces old or senile lords out and it stops those that don't bother turning up from having a role and it gets rid of people like Geoffrey Archer. So um, that's pretty cool. And that is this part. Uh, so you should have everything you need there. If you need to pause the video, now is a good time to pause it. You can literally see the whole slide. And then we move on to backbenchers. Um, and here is a picture of Parliament, um, and it's fairly recent. And you get a feel of what we mean by backbenchers. This clearly is before coronavirus. Here are the backbenchers. All of them, all of them, and all of the people around here are backbenchers. You can tell it's fairly early on because Corbyn's still there as leader of the Labour Party. Um, so what are backbench MPs? They're MPs in the House of Commons or the House of Lords who are not members of the government or the shadow cabinet. They sit at the back on benches, which are at the back and are benches. Um, this allows them tremendous independence. They are not bound by collective ministerial responsibility, which I'll talk about more later. And therefore they can say what they like about government policy if they're on the government benches, and they can say what they like about opposition policy if they're on the opposition benches. They're allowed to respond almost entirely to their constituents' desires and, um, well, beyond um, that, at their own conscience. Uh, that's good. But they're expected to obey whips when it comes to um, votes in Parliament, and that means they're limited in what they're able to do. So what do we need to know about them? Backbenchers are a key way that the executive, that is the government to you and I, and Parliament interact. They're the main sort of vector of communication between the two. They're protected by parliamentary privilege, which was set in place by the Bill of Rights in 1689. 
and it offered legal protection for what um, politicians said in the House of Parliament. It says this, the freedom of speech and debates and proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. In other words, if you say something in Parliament, you cannot be taken to court for libel. Furthermore, you can't be taken to court for hate speech. You can say literally anything in a parliamentary debate. And the idea is it allows MPs the safety to raise any issue that is worthy of the nation's or the government's attention. And on the face of it, that is a really, really helpful power. Uh, does it still work? There we go. So what functions and powers do backbenchers have? Well, the first function they provide is legitimation. They provide legitimacy. Uh, they can legalize things. They can legitimate things. Uh, for example, the use of the armed forces. It's become a convention that if Britain uh, commits armed forces, backbenchers have to vote on it. Now, sure, they have to obey their whips, theoretically speaking, but they'll do as they are told. The second thing is they represent their constituents. They can raise issues that their constituents want raised in Parliament. We saw that time and again with Dominic Goings, I mean Cummings, in the summer um, from the opposition benches mainly. And one or two Conservatives did raise issues. They were obeyed the vote and made sure it went no further because constituents were literally flooding their inboxes. I have never seen a flurry of emails or letters like that. Now, that doesn't mean much. I'm just an old man. Um, so in my time on this earth, uh, I won't have seen much bigger than that. That doesn't mean it's the biggest in history. It doesn't mean it's terribly important. It does mean it's a good example, though. Um, the textbook doesn't know about that. And so went with Bottomley. Uh, there he is in 2018. And he raised during a discussion about um, uh, Verde, uh, or Verde. Um, hang on. I hate it when my brain works like this. I've got to then go look things up. Um, oh, curses, now my place is born out. Uh, so Peter Bottomley is an MP. Um, there was an adjournment debate to demand a full inquiry into the case of former police sergeant Gerpel Verdi, who'd uh, been taken to court over a uh, historic case of sexual abuse and then acquitted. And basically what he did was, because his constituents were pressuring him, he turned it into a big deal about whether or not the law was fit for purpose and whether or not a new law needed to be passed. Well done, Sir Peter Bottomley. There's also the Backbench Business Committee, which was founded in 2010 during the coalition government. And this is a bunch of backbenchers who get together and they managed to get the government to agree that for 35 days of parliament in a year, they got control of the agenda, meaning that they can put forward issues for debate and they can put forward private members bills and they can build in stuff that otherwise the government wouldn't talk about. So, that makes backbenchers reasonably powerful too, because they don't have to go through their party leadership to get things on the agenda. They can go through the backbench business committee. The idea was it would reduce rebellions because there'd be a vent uh, and, a, and a blow off point for backbenchers to uh, let off steam, um, for want of a better phrase. Um, oh, I've just realized, look, that's Pauline Megan. Um, there's the e-petitions committee as well in 2015. And it was set up to assign time for debate and discussion of any issue that received 100,000 signatures on an electronic petition and whether or not it was suitable to have a debate on. So, for example, there were several e-petitions in 2018 and 2019 talking about banning Donald Trump from visiting Britain, which was ridiculous. Parliament doesn't have that power to stop a head of state visiting the country if they've been invited. So, um, yeah, there were pointless debates, uh, but the e-petitions committee still had to timetable time in Parliament to discuss that, even if the discussion was, we can't do that, end discussion. Um, but there are other things they do have to bring in. They can also raise awareness. They can use parliamentary business to make a point. And here is another link. This one is on YouTube. Um, this is Michelle Thompson in 2016, talking on the uh, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And she opened up with how she'd been raped at the age of 14 and thus raised the issue in Parliament and gained plaudits from across the country for doing so. It also led to a debate on rape laws in this country and the rape conviction rate, which is fantastically small. Um, that's a sociology issue, I guess, but it's also a political issue um, because it's really weird how small that is and how police can confiscate the phone of a victim but rarely, if ever, confiscate the phone of 
uh, an alleged attacker. Uh, and it gets better. The victims don't get their phones back. That's a law in this country. Uh, and she raised numerous issues. The speech is there on YouTube. You can click on that link on the PowerPoint or type it in, I suppose. Um, are backbenchers effective? Well, after 1997 and 2001, when Tonti Blair uh, gained a landslide victory, no, no, they weren't. Um, Tonti Blair could essentially ignore his backbenchers regardless of how big the rebellion got. As a case in point, in 2003 with the Iraq war, um, 139 of his own party voted against going to war in Iraq. Blair still won the vote because his majority was so large. And as a consequence, he ignored them because he could. That would make backbenchers really unimportant. But after 2005, when the government majority was used to just 66, I say just 66, um, 49 people voted against the government on the counter-terrorism bill, uh, arguing for people to be held for 90 days without charge, and it failed. That rebellion was enough. 49 backbenchers were suddenly effective. And let's not even get started after the 2017 election uh, until 2019 general election, when Theresa Human Rights for Optional May um, really didn't lead the Brexit process so much as some manage it, kind of, uh, because backbenchers could literally push the government around. And they did, of course. Famously, in the summer of 2019, Parliament took control of the process from the executive. That was really quite a big deal. Um, and for a while there, things got really febrile. And obviously, May eventually had to step down. She was a dead woman walking. It was really exciting at the time. The textbook doesn't cover it all because it stopped in February 2019. And bless that textbook. It didn't know what the summer of 2019 would bring. And for a while, it was the most exciting news in Parliament uh, and in politics. Of course, it isn't now because we've had 2020. And now 2021, which is probably going to even knock the pandemic out uh, as the biggest talked about issue. Eh, it doesn't matter. You get the idea. There's also the strange case of Frank Field. Um, who resigned the Labour whip in August 2018. And the reason I include him is, what is the role of a backbencher? So Frank Field, I've mentioned before, is the leader of a, a House committee. And he was a respected leader of that, but he was a maverick MP. So in many cases, rather than siding with Labour, to which he was putatively a part, he often voted with the Conservatives on uh, acts of austerity, for example, uh, economic austerity in particular, and also during Brexit. He uh, disobeyed the party whips very, very regularly and was well known as reasonably a, a supporter of the Conservatives, but on the Labour bench. He nevertheless kept winning elections. His argument was, like Edmund Burke, that he was voted in not to represent his constituents' demands, but for his conscience and his own abilities, his own judgment. And he would act on his own judgment. He believed Brexit was a good idea. He believed that the Conservatives had the right idea with austerity, and therefore he would vote on those things, whether or not his constituents agreed. It reached ahead when his um, constituency party, and the Labour Party is a federation of constituency parties, it's not one monolithic thing. Uh, the constituency party voted no confidence in him as their representative in Parliament. They argued that, sure, he had the ability to make his own judgments, but at the end of the day, he should still represent the Labour voters of the region by following Labour Party policy. And they voted to not put him forward as their local MP at the next general election. He retaliated by resigning the Labour whip and leaving the Labour Party, but remaining as an MP. Because he didn't resign, he therefore didn't call in a by-election. He then went on television, arguing that the main reason he'd done it was because the CLP, the constituency Labour Party, of his constituency was overrun by nasty, vicious people who were increasingly anti-Semitic. I'm uncertain what the connection between anti-Semitism and his activities and his eventual vote of no confidence was, but he believed that absolutely was one. And the YouTube link that I've got there is a link to an interview where he explains his reasons for why he came out. Now, I should point out it's held by an account called Liar Politicians. But nevertheless, it is an interview in his own words. It's the best copy I could find, and I apologize. 
And in the House of Lords, what about backbenchers there? Well, they can introduce private members' bills, much like they can do in the House of Commons, and they have about as much chance of success as members of the House of Commons putting forward a private members' bill. But primarily, their job is scrutiny. They're there to question ministers, and um, the government, I've missed the word government out there, it's just a govt through committees. Um, and it's worth pointing out that the committees are highly respected because of their independence and because of their expertise. And therefore, these questions carry weight that other questions simply don't. And because they're permanently in session, or rather they don't go back to their constituencies, they can do this at a time that suits the minister more than the House of Commons can, when the House of Commons generally gets full of business that has to be done. And that brings us to the end of a double lesson. And I'm really sorry that it's taken me this long to post it. Um, I'm hoping that you don't mind. If you watch those video links, it'll go well over two hours. Um, and making the notes, obviously, do use the video to go backwards and forwards. Um, I'm just gonna see, hold on. I found Pauline Latham. Can I find my local MP on that screen? The answer is no, I can't. I wonder where she is then. Oh, Maggie Throop. She usually sits over here where that lady is, but I don't think that's Maggie Throop. Um, oh, well, there you go. Um, so, sucks to me, I guess. That's the two um, hours of lesson-ish. I mean, the video isn't two hours long. Um, if you watch all the videos and this video, it still won't be two hours, but you're making notes, you're going backwards and forwards. I appreciate it's difficult in a home situation, especially as this has gone up slightly late. So take your time on it. I'm hoping to uh, see you all tomorrow in our uh, teams meeting. Um, I haven't scheduled it yet. I will do as soon as this is gone. By the time this goes live, it will probably be set, uh, scheduled anyway. But I'll see you then uh, for the first lesson around about 9.25 and we'll have a chat about what we've seen so far. I said I was going to leave you with a task and the task is this. In the textbook uh, on Parliament and what have you, you'll find on page 183 a thing about whether or not backbenchers or how do I put it, uh, playing an important role in the House of Commons. Now that information is fine. I could have put it on the PowerPoint, but it would have been the most boring thing imaginable. So what I'd like you to do is find that information and then it's on page 183. And I'd like you to create a more interesting way of displaying it. That's it. Just put it in your notes in an interesting way. Or you can record a video of a song or um, something creative or maybe make a poster. I don't know. Find a way of making it more interesting and easier to remember than the textbook. The textbook's done a good job. It's done it in bullet points. I get what they've tried there, but you have more abilities at your disposal than someone trying to write a textbook. And frankly, more abilities at your disposal than I do making a PowerPoint and I can't sing. So hopefully that all makes sense. Thank you if you have been for watching. Have a lovely rest of day and I shall see you tomorrow in a Teams meeting. And if not then, in the next video. Um, cue YouTube music that I don't have because I'm not a YouTuber.